follow me to the church. Hi, everybody. I'm Lisa Jones. And I'm Cade Roberts. Yeah, and welcome to From the Chamber. We are at the Harwelden Mansion. We've got a couple of guests with us today. We're going to talk about what this podcast is all about. This is our first one. It's going to be coming up, right, gang? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we have Teresa Knox. We have Amber Acosta. Teresa is what... She is Harwelden Mansion, <laughs> and all the, the real star, though, of this podcast is going to be the church studio. So we want to talk about the church studio and why we're even having a podcast, right, Teresa? That's right. Yeah, tell us about it. So from the chamber, wh what are we doing here? Well, uh, first and foremost, uh, we wanted to come up with a, a fun title that kind of encompasses what we're doing at the church. So... Um, obviously, we're going to have more than reverb at the church, but uh, <laughs> during this uh, historic renovation that we're doing, we have created two subterrain echo chambers uh, to capture sound uh, in an echo sort of way. And um, the church studio, of course, made famous by Leon Russell. In and is a national landmark. Absolutely. It's listed on the National Register of Historic Places. And it is, it's a national landmark. And that was really important. When I bought the church, it was not listed, but I thought it was so- <laughs> It was barely standing. <laughs> <laughs> this Let's is be true, real. <laughs> this is true. I think I had buyer's remorse. Uh, the, the you bought it side, on, you didn't get to go inside, right? I didn't, I didn't. I, I wanted it so badly, so I contacted the owner and um, just started visiting with him and um, I, I didn't get to see it. So I uh, closed on the property and then that's when I, I saw it. And so, uh, you know. Um, and started the work getting it on the national list. Yeah, that was my first goal. So I wanted to capture, you know, the, the true history, not only of Leon, but of Shelter Records and the other artists that have recorded in there. And so I started interviewing people. And so I did phone interviews, I did in person, I captured a lot of them on video, which is part of our Legend series, which is another show that we have uh, for the church. And it was just so magical what happened. And it was so important that I thought, you know what, this is really cool, not just for our hometown, which is Tulsa, Oklahoma, but for America and American rock and roll. And so I went on this very long journey and uh, to uh, capture it in the right way and get it listed. So, and and we made it happen. Yeah, and Amber's kind of been your right-hand girl yes. all along. <laughs> Amber's you fantastic. You don't get to sit there, Amber, and just well, act I'm innocent. Well, I'm trying. <laughs> I appreciate that, but yeah. yeah. No, Amber's terrific. Uh, I hired her on the team early on to help us uh, basically archive and um, put in a database our collection. I've been a Leon Russell fan since I was about eight years old. I have a 5,000 piece collection of all things Leon, Shelter Records and, and other artists. And, and so uh, I thought, you know what, I wanna do this the right way. And so Amber started and she's a Leon fan as well. Mm -hmm. And she, we created this database and, and that's how we know how many pieces we have. <laughs> uh, we have a a lot of stuff so yeah so from the chamber it's going to be Kate and I talking to sound engineers we're going to be talking yeah. to musicians mm -hmm. and about everything right yeah the record industry making records music they love it's really for people that want to hear about some of the people that they look up to in the music industry and and just kind of have fun chatting about music and just uh we want to kind of deepen people's right. appreciation of music from the past and of the future and get people excited about what's happening right now. And that's one of the things I love about Teresa's mindset is that you're very much into honoring the past but not staying in the past. Right. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And is that something you want to elaborate a little more on about with we the church the, studio and your yeah. vision of, for the future? Yeah. We love the Tulsa sound, no doubt, but we also want to get beyond that. I mean, the Tulsa sound is known worldwide, as everyone knows. So there's so many great artists that came um, out of Tulsa, Oklahoma, especially during that period of significance in the 70s, inspired by Leon Russell, J.J. Kill, and others. But um, you're right, Kate. I mean, we don't want to live in the past, but we definitely want to honor the past, and we want to learn by those musicians. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but we want to be a viable, relevant, working recording studio um, to today's artist because, you know, there's so many uh, substitute and alternative products on capturing sound, yeah. including the home recording studio, which mm -hmm. you know something about yeah. since yeah. you have one. Mm -hmm. And so uh, we just want to be kind of a turnkey operation for today's music and a lot of disruption going on in the industry. And, and we want to be a part of the future. Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I, and 
in the year 2020, uh, you know, it, the trend has very much been for studios to get smaller and smaller over the last two decades, really. People are making records out of their bedrooms, a lot it's of artists long. are and stuff. And I'm curious how you see the large format, format studio like the church. You know, since I've been a part of it, I've been able to really see behind the scenes just how large of an undertaking that is with the large form, format console and the echo chambers and all that stuff. And it's like, this is a massive undertaking. And, and I'm curious to get your thoughts on, on where that fits in to today's industry and how that can be, uh, how that can work. Well, um, I'll let you know. <laughs> no, it it um, it really is a passion project. It's it's very expensive, and I tease all the time. It's a very expensive hobby, and yeah. um, because we want to bring the studio back for not only the latest and greatest and what's going on in the digital world, but in analog studios, well, yeah. so we've invested in a significant microphone collection, uh, a lot of vintage tube mics. Uh, German mics, of course, AKGs, uh, Neumann, so many others. Mm-hmm. Um, our console is a vintage Neve 8067 um, that we purchased from Daniel Lenoir. And so when you add all of those things in and tape machines, it is a very expensive undertaking. Mm-hmm. And we've seen over and over again that studios just are not making it out there. They're going out of business because people can record. And digital is so easy. And we're not saying that analog is better than digital. They're both very, very important. But uh, in addition to the recording studio, we are going to have a really uh, diverse strategy and what we're going to be offering so not only are we coming back as a recording studio but uh, we are going to have education programs Uh, we're going to become a licensed vocational school for sound engineering and music production Mm -hmm. Uh, we're going to be home of course to we're calling it the church studio archive uh, which is uh, my personal collection and so with that we'll be able to create various exhibits Mm -hmm. Um, we'll have some permanent pieces that like for example uh, we have a self-portrait that Leon Russell did that will uh, probably would be you know permanently displayed but we're going to be creating exhibits that show the process of music but also other exhibits of other artists we are also going to have our own um, programming so we'll have private music events um, we'll be able to um, with these guys I mean our video crew uh, yeah, are amazing room, yeah so absolutely we'll guys. I mean, these guys are awesome <laughs> Uh, they are called Grassfire Creative, and they uh, have this really cool studio across the street from the church. And so we are setting the church up really for high def video because we want to be able to offer multiple things to artists, including like podcast opportunities, um, video programming, and again, private performances. And so back in the day when Leon Russell had the studio, you really had to know someone in order to get in the studio (laughs) or be super beautiful and good looking, (laughs) talented or gorgeous. And so we just want to open it up to the general community community as a as an event center and community space as well as long as we always protect the artists that are recording in there and their privacy well this is a good time for you to tell your story about when you used to drive around the church studio when you were younger oh yeah that's so funny you mentioned that so um i have four historic properties that i've renovated i do a lot of real estate development now commercial real estate but there's a property very close by the church and i started renovating that that project and i'm very hands-on on construction projects so going there every day but i found myself after i don't know 30 years uh, driving by the church and uh, I was a little disappointed in the shape that was in so I would stop pull over you know pick up the trash and um, you know and I just got obsessed with it but back in the day when I used to go by there I was just I knew I was going to see Eric Clapton or Leon <laughs> Russell and uh, I was such a wannabe groupie and, and I'm glad I didn't see them because uh, who knows I would have done anything who knows what you would have done <laughs> in there. How yeah. you I'm very very friendly and warm with musicians so that would have gotten me in a lot of trouble and but. speaking of those names who all recorded 
you know, at the church studio? Well, um, the church has an amazing history, but there, and of course, tons of people recorded at the church, but even more so, a lot of people just hung out there. Mm -hmm. So as far as recording, uh, you've mentioned uh, her a lot, but Phoebe Snow, the Gap Band, it's where Tom Petty got his start, Tom Petty and the Heartbreakers. Back then, they were called Mud Crutch. And um, so Willie Nelson and Willie Nelson's sister, um, but other people played there and recorded there and hung out there, like Kansas, um, wow. Stevie Wonder, yeah. uh, wow, which a lot cool. of people don't talk about. Um, of course, J.J. Kell, Freddie King. Um, it was just kind of a go-to spot because, you know, we, and I've mentioned this before because I love to brag about Leon Russell, and I didn't know him. I mean, again, I'm purely a fan. But in 1972, Billboard magazine said he was the number one touring artist in America, and he was working on his fourth album. He just put it out, Carney, in March 1st of 72. He came back to his hometown immediately found the church, closed on it, and he could have gone anywhere, but right. he wanted to come back to his hometown. And Leon came from the studios, uh, especially in California, that were a little more sterile environment. You still had engineers and lab coats. You had the money guys, the suits that were more formal. And Leon felt that it really stifled the creative process. Right. The, the whole vibe. Yeah, yeah, the whole vibe. And so not only did he want the the spiritual and the cool history of this 100-year-old church, but he wanted a casual environment where artists and songwriters and producers and and um, the musicians could come together and create really cool music without, you know, some guy saying, you know, you got to knock out 10 songs, you know, mm -hmm. over the next mm -hmm. week. And so people, he never called himself this, but he was an entrepreneur. He's very entrepreneurial. He has referred to that space as a creative workshop, and that's really what it was. And that's what we want to do is create a creative workshop that, that's comfortable but is committed to excellence. Yeah. yeah, and you are really headed in the right direction. It's going to be all of those things you mentioned, but it is going to go back to being a recording studio. Yes, first and foremost, it's a recording studio. And that wasn't my original plan. When I bought the church, saw the shape it was in, I thought, okay, I'm going to put a coat of paint and, you know, <laughs> fix it up. I'm just going to be my uh, my own personal man cave, yeah. but girl cave. Yeah. Um, but again, when I started interviewing and, and thinking about everything that we were doing, I thought, this has to become a recording studio again. But my capitalistic business mindset of, you know, oh shit, recording studios <laughs> do not make money. And I looked at 50 uh, business models of recording studios. I cannot find one that was doing it, you know, in a way that I thought we could, um, you know, get a return on our investment. Right. And so mm -hmm. that's why I started diversifying in my thinking um, and using my background in higher education, vocational education, and engaging an online audience. We have this really cool space. It's this brick and mortar space. But really, when you look at our strategy, it's 90% digital. The, the brick and mortar, the archive of the church itself is really just icing on the cake. Yeah. So, you know, part of everything else that we're doing is creating uh, an entertainment network. Uh, we already have a, a great fan base. They love Leon. They love what we're doing. They love Amber. <laughs> it's like, will you give Amber a message? Uh, she's so great with them. Um, but... Um, we um yeah we just want to we want to be relevant but we want to be smart and strategic in our business strategy as well today's episode is brought to you by the historic harwelden mansion your choice for a luxury bed and breakfast experience and the church studio home to your favorite rock and roll t-shirt the church studio was the Abbey Road of America in the 1970s when Rock and Roll Hall of Famer and Grammy Award winning singer, songwriter, and musician Leon Russell purchased a 100 year old church and turned it into a recording studio and home office to shelter records. Now under significant renovation to bring it back to a recording studio, entertainment network, and community space. Get your church merch fixed today at thechurchstudio.com. Cool gear includes super soft t-shirts, hoodies, hats, journals, stickers, candles, and so much more. Thechurchstudio.com. So with the studio, uh, you have two of the industry leaders in studio design. They've worked with the likes of, you know, Mark Ronson and Garth Brooks. And I'm talking about, of course, Chad Haley and Stephen Durr. Uh, 
tell us about how you got in contact with them. They are fantastic. So when I, obviously I don't have any experience running a recording studio, so I started asking around. And of course, when you talk with our architects and others, they're very formal on what they want to do from acoustical design and engineering. Yeah. And I thought, that's too sterile. It's mm -hmm. not Leon Russell. It's not the vibe that we want for the artist. And so my good friend, Jamie Oldacre, um, and may he rest in peace. He mm, passed absolutely. away recently. Um, you know, international award-winning drummer with Eric Clapton and yeah. Peter Frampton and so many others. He said, "You, you've got to meet Chad Haley." And and Chad, of course, yeah, that fantastic history. Neil Young. He worked with Peter Frampton as well. So many other artists. And um, so I met Chad. And what's cool? I wanted to use people from this local area because I, I like to support our local businesses. Mm -hmm. But I couldn't find anyone with that experience. But what was cool about Chad? is when he was a teenager, he was hired at a Nashville studio um, uh, with a guy by the name of Adi and- Adi uh, Ashworth. Yes, mm -hmm. and uh, John Kell or JJ Kell uh, was there and actually trained him. So he knew all about Leon and, and uh, the church studio and we really hit it off. Wow. And so then he introduced me to Steve Durr and Steve has a history early on when he was a teenager running sound, including Mad Dogs and Englishmen, which was oh, a 6970 wow. tour Joe with, with Joe yeah. Cocker and, yeah. and Leon Russell. So even though they're out of state and not really from where the church is located, uh, their ears are really wired and they are committed to excellence. And uh, they will not do any project in, unless they think, one, that we have the budget to be able to support yeah. it, but that we're committed to making really amazing, exceptional sound recording. Yeah, and one of the things I, I really love about Steve is that he's just all about vibe and about mm -hmm. creating a space that musicians just don't want to leave. And so uh, I'd love to hear you highlight some of the things about the church that, that make it that really vibey space that's going to be really special and a, a space people just don't want to leave because you've you've got plans for big artists i mean you've already got some commitments you've been yeah. talking to some right yeah definitely uh legacy artist you know international national artist uh, of course, you know, we want to support our local artists and, mm -hmm. uh, and young musicians are get, that are getting their start in, in the field. So, um, but yeah, the church has a really cool vibe. One, it's just a church. Yeah. You know, it was built in 1915. Mm -hmm. um, it was Grace Methodist Episcopal Church. And it was the church for the people and it was built by the people. And so in our community, we have some of the most elaborate churches in America, Art Deco churches, that sort of thing. Yeah. But this was kind of a response to that because it was built for the poor people. And what's really interesting to note, it was Tulsa's first integrated church. So we had blacks and whites attending at the same time, and that was unheard of in 1915 yeah. Yeah. through the 1920s. And that's so reflective of Leon. And then also, uh, you know, connecting and doing my interviews, I found the great grandson of the original pastor of the church. And I was able to capture the first mantra of the church. And what's really cool about it is if you're downtrodden, if you're poor, if you're hungry, if you need help, it, you know, if you need counsel, you know, we are the church to provide shelter for you. And that was written in 1913. It was displayed in 1915. Wow. So it was this whole foreshadowing of Shelter Records yeah. because the church studio was home office to Shelter Records in 1972. So first and foremost, if you think about all the weddings, all of the sorrow, all of the heartache, all of the celebrations, and uh, there is a church studio in London that Leon was familiar with. And I think he really wanted that. He was a very spiritual person. Yeah, sure. So that creates a vibe in itself. Um, but then just that when you look at the original woodwork of the 100-year-old the wood, bringing that back the, the way that it was, I mean, the sanctuary itself will hold a small orchestra. And so when you walk in, and people that are really in tune to that, they get chills when they walk in that space. And so that first and foremost creates a great vibe, but you couple that with the the equipment that we have curated for that space, mm -hmm. um, it's just going to, to 
it's just going to be beautiful. And then, of course, when you look at the mechanics of the acoustical design, um, you know, the airlocks, the spacing, there is not one nail in that church. They're not allowed. And wow. so everything is screwed in. Um, or glued, and we have signs everywhere, glue it or screw it. And uh, <laughs> you can interpret that however you want. It's like, okay, I'm in. Leon would appreciate it. Yeah, that. absolutely. Definitely. So, But uh, anyway, it's, it's going to take a life of its own, but that sound is so important. And it is going to be a sound that we're going to capture uh, digitally through plugins. So we may have people that want to come to the church, but maybe they can't travel or they can't afford it at the time. But uh, through their Pro Tools plugins, they're going to be able to capture uh, the church studio sound. Wow, yeah. that's really neat. Very historic sound. Leon yeah. had, I mean, talk about a little bit about what he did. He was, you know, he wasn't just a touring musician. He was a musical arranger for Beach Boys, for all of those people in the early, you know, late 60s, mid 60s. He was in L.A. doing that kind of stuff. Yeah, no, absolutely. He was part of the Wrecking, Wrecking Crew. Crew. Mm-hmm. Yeah, right. and so he's a session museum for, and one of the most coveted because you look at someone like, absolutely. and I love Glenn Campbell, and he and uh, Leon were very close, but, you know, Glenn would be the first to admit he can't read music, but, and a lot of people thought Leon was just this Oklahoma redneck. No, he was a genius at arranging. He was. I was at a studio in L.A., to, you know, just I, I've just been doing my due diligence to learn about it, and uh, their engineer, and it was at Sunset Sound, said, you know, I can't believe Leon did what he did and he couldn't even read music. And I was like, oh, you know, I about <laughs> choked. I was like, you're kidding me. He started playing music and was classically trained at the age of four years old. But he had that vibe about him that maybe he, he could play by ear, of course. He was yeah. brilliant. Yeah. Um, but, um, but yes, he did everything. And, and Amber's worked directly with our archive. So you can talk about some of the things we have from, you know, writing uh, music all the way. Instruments and the, we have Leon's music that it's handwritten that he would, for each instrument, he would write out the music for it and everything for everyone. It's got his signature on it. So things like that. There's the instruments that we have. We have Leon's, some of his hats and his canes, which are some of my favorite things. Um, and all yeah. of this is done with the blessing of his family, right? Right, exactly. Of course, and that you was know. an ordeal, I mean, for you. Well, I would not call it. A, his family has been very cordial. Um, but Leon was alive when I purchased the church. So I had this fantasy that he was going to be on my advisory <laughs> board. And he was going to just tell me, you know, exactly how to do this. And unfortunately, he passed away, I think, a couple of months after I yep, purchased right it. After. Mm-hmm. And I was so devastated. But yeah. it was, you know... Uh, it anyway so i had an opportunity to uh, to meet with his widow and uh they were downsizing over over a period of time so i was able to acquire some things but our collection is really from a fan perspective mm-hmm. and so it's it's a, a unique way of looking at it but we're excited about sharing it with everyone um, but you're right. When you look at, we have handwritten lyrics, we have handwritten music, and we can create, which is part of the education side of mm-hmm. it, from an idea to a few lyrics, some melodies. Okay, these are the songs that we want to do. Let's write in an orchestra. Let's make mm-hmm. it full blown. Now, what order do we want on the album? Let's create the album art. And it's like, okay, let's execute this full marketing strategy to sell a million albums. Mm-hmm. So we can recreate that entire process because, Leon, you're right, singer, songwriter, entrepreneur, business person. Mm-hmm. And so he could do all of it. And that's really rare. You don't see that with artists exactly. these days. Now, he worked with everyone. Absolutely. Was anyone. And a lot of times he folded the the Tulsa guys into it you know, yes out in LA. he was very very loyal to um you know this is his home state he was born in Lawton Oklahoma but grew up in Tulsa mm-hmm. and so when he needed musicians and and you ask anyone in LA if if you say you're from Tulsa it's like you're hired as a session musician because they knew you were good mm-hmm. and so there's a lot of reasons why we had so many great musicians and everyone has different opinions i've interviewed dwight twilly Mm -hmm. um he thinks it's because the local bar scene didn't pay very well and so they had to work really hard to get out of the marketplace (laughs) i always claim it's because we don't have a beach so you're not hanging out somewhere and you're just but we all grew up even myself we had music every day in our school system we all learned to read music play instruments everyone had a garage band so um, Oklahoma has always encouraged music, and 
um, in that shows with all the artists that come out of here. Yeah, he certainly did. He encouraged it. Yeah. Yeah. He went to Rogers High School, and let's see who was going there at the same time. David... Yeah, David bre- Gates. David Gates. Yeah, and- David Gates of Bread, and he uh, has... I love David Gates. I was say, it's, Teresa uh, has a little thing for David yeah, Gates. You've got a little crush And it's going. kind of embarrassing because, you know, I'm this I'm this hardcore rock and roll chick, and it's like, I like soft rock. And because David Gates was soft rock, but he was a great songwriter, too. And he and, and Leon, of course, worked together. And right. they did have a falling out later on. I don't know all the details behind it. But David Gates, Anita Bryant, um, you know, attended... Um, uh, Elvin Bishop yeah. and so he was another person from that but then you have so many other people that are from the Tulsa Sound Gary Busey is a good friend of mine and people don't realize he got his start uh um, in music with Leon oh, yeah. at the church That's how studio. He got the Betty Holly role. Yeah, he was Leon's drummer, and so they became fast friends. He's the one that introduced Leon Russell to Barbara Streisand when a star mm-hmm. star is born uh, was being filmed. Uh, Leon helped uh, Barbara finish uh, songs for that soundtrack, mm-hmm. and so um, it's it's really cool. So uh, it wouldn't be 2020 if we didn't talk about the pandemic of course (laughs) and it's devastated the live music industry devastated a lot of musicians careers in a lot of ways but i'm curious the effect it's had on the recording industry and what your perspective is on that how it's affected the recording studio industry I think it's affected it in a really positive way. And I know Lisa, you can probably attest to this. Lisa is married to Grammy Award winning drummer <laughs> David T. Garden of T. Garden Studios. And, and T. Garden Studios is one block uh, west of the church studio. And David's been busy, right? Busier than ever. Right. Than he's been mm-hmm. as busy as he wants to be. Right. Yeah. Which is great. Absolutely. Yeah. And when you read about other studios, even in Europe, Peter Gabriel's, others, and I mean, people are busy. Don't you think it's because, too, the artists are getting, like, the first chance to, like, just sit still for a minute? Yeah. For sure. They're yeah. creating Absolutely. work. They're, you know, they're writing and they're, they're right. you know. Well, the, the, the disruption to business is so drastic. And with the music industry, I mean, where were artists making their music? Well, on touring, right? They're not touring right now. Mm -hmm. And I've had a chance to visit with some really great artists that said, you know what? I've been really sloppy on my recording. It's been a little bit more on the digital side. It's been fast. It's been about quantity. Let's really hone in on our craft, what we love anyway, and really focusing on really good recording. And so a lot of them are getting out of their home studios and they want that experience. Isn't that what all of us want? We want a new experience, including artists in different recording studios. So I think this is a killer opportunity for recording studios. Yeah. You have some commitments too from some good big names. Jack White now has a home in Tulsa, right? Yeah, we'd love to get him uh, definitely in the studio. He has his own studio in Nashville and he, he has have one a in church studio, <laughs> Teresa. <laughs> no, no, he doesn't. And he's very familiar with it. And he's a really, really great guy. And I got a great chance to visit with him in, in Detroit at his place. And and so, yeah, we definitely do. Uh, of course, anything's possible. So as my mother said, don't count your chickens before they hatch. But <laughs> we have, uh, including a really, um, a really neat, what I would call a legacy artist that uh, has expressed interest. So you're not um, going to name drop. Well, drop I, 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 I can see how that's so easy to do in this industry, <laughs> but um, I don't want to eat my words later, and I don't want to jinx it. But um, I do think that we will um, be a studio to reckon with. Uh, we will be competing with the LA, the Nashville, the New York market, uh, not just because of the history of the space, but the equipment, uh, the engineers, just the whole process. Well, the location, too. Exactly. I mean, in Tulsa. Yeah, that's a really great point. We've been lobbying for flights from Nashville to Tulsa, from L.A. uh, to Tulsa. And, in fact, that one just happened right before the pandemic. Mm -hmm. And so it's like, man. (laughs) So, uh, yeah, we want to offer just a really cool experience for these artists. And this beautiful mansion, this historic mansion that we're in, Harwelden, which we call it our sister property, um, it's really part of that vision because we have a gorgeous bed and breakfast. We can stunning oh well thank you yeah this is earl's chamber as you right. referenced early on that we're in but it's a fifteen thousand square foot mansion 
built a few years after the church in 1923, but we can curate the entire experience for these artists. They fly into town, you know, what kind of drinks, beverages, food, entertainment. Our driver will take them to the church. So, First class. Yeah, we're going to provide the, yeah. the entire experience for them. So. Yeah, and you you touched a little bit on the education part that the church studio wants to do. You're you they're, you're floating an idea, or maybe it's more concrete than I know, but you're going to maybe have the church studio as part of a Nashville, New York, you know, circuit where artists can go and record at each one. Right, yeah, we have been talking with some other, uh, what I would consider historic, legendary studios that are still working. Some, as you know, are just museums, like maybe Motown, for example. Exactly. And uh, we don't want to be like that, even though I love that place, and yeah. I've had an opportunity to visit it. But yeah, what's great with technology that you can't get with analog and other things is that, you know, you can concurrently work with other studios on a project. You can have an artist at the church, you can have them in other places, and in real time, uh, we can work together. So that's another great thing about technology that that we are embracing. But yeah, the education side is, is super important. We are working on a curriculum, again, for sound engineers because... We think it's important. It's a, it's not really a lost art, but there aren't as many programs as there used to be. And I started a school 25 years ago, so my passion really is education, vocational, very specific technical education that leads to a very specific uh, degree. Yeah. And so, or not a degree, a, a diploma or a certificate. But um, yeah, so we want to host students and interns, put them through this program, and not only you know to work at the church, but to uh, provide opportunities for other studios to hire them as well. Mm-hmm. That's right up your alley, Kay. Yeah, I think that's uh, really important because, like I mentioned earlier, or like you referenced, really, I, I come also from the more of the bedroom studio. Mine's a garage studio, so it's a little bit better than a bedroom. But <laughs> you, know, you know, but that that large format uh, studio is very much a lost art in many ways, and it, and it's really neat to to be involved, even the way I am. But uh, and I think that I think that's very good to educate people about that because it's not just about the past it is about the future it's about mm-hmm. hey maybe there's some of these techniques that have been lost that shouldn't have been lost you know right. and maybe it's not an improvement in some ways there, there's parts about the digital technology that, that are really good but let's not forget about the parts of the analog technology that are really good as well and so we can become better yeah. in the future that's so true just the warmth of analog yeah. i mean it's just you know, if you have a good master that's on vinyl and you're listening, I mean, it's so great. And you have to, and digital is so good too. You could do so much with it, but you have to remember it's a computer interpretation of that sound. Yeah. And so, and then when that happens over and over and finally ends up on YouTube, it's so compressed that to someone that really loves good music, it's it's difficult to listen to and it's exhausting to your ears. We all remember those albums that you could listen over and over and over and over again. It's not exhausting. But again, there's a there's a place for both. And you know, one thing that I've noticed a lot with artists that they can mix it to death and all of a sudden that, you know, it's an okay recording, they do it and they just keep perfecting it. Versus back in the day, the, the expectation was, you know your music, you have all the artists in a room, you better know your stuff because yeah. when you're recording it, that's what you're gonna get. And I absolutely love, and we'll have a little bit of both. Yeah, and I think uh, there's something also about a space like the church studio, knowing the history, of course, and then just the grandioseness of it that I think uh, kind of calls for a certain amount of excellence in artists. And I think a lot of artists are gonna walk out of there having captured performances of stuff that they've, they've never captured before, you know, right. performances that they're more proud of than they've ever captured before, just because of the space and the vibe and things drawing it out of them. Yeah. And that's one of the things that, that I, I'm really happy about seeing you being involved with this, because I know that you have a very good ear for sound and it's something that you're passionate about with the podcast and with everything mm-hmm. The you know, it all comes from this passion for educating people on great sound, getting people to appreciate music more than they realize that they can you know, by educating them on a lot of these things. So I love that. Yeah, well, thanks. The spark well, plug of Studio Row. Absolutely. That's yeah. what they call her. <laughs> she tries to deny I think it. you're the only person no. that's... No, no, David no. does. <laughs> David the does. spark plug. <laughs> well, that's really nice. But uh, it's definitely a team effort. I mean, you guys, Cade's on the team. And again, 
uh, Grass Fire. Uh, why don't you guys introduce yourself? Yeah, bartender. <laughs> bartender, so bar goes first, drinks go first. Well, yeah, you got to have priorities. That. Yeah, we can do that. Um, I'm John Moss. I come from a television background, so live TV, live production. Uh, Lisa and I have that in common. We mm-hmm. lived in the TV world for a while, and then I'll let the guys in front of me. Uh, Jordan, you want to go? Yeah, uh, Jordan Price. Um, came from an audio background, had the garage studio. Um, I think back in like 99, I was one of the first two or three to have a Pro Tools rig in Tulsa area. Uh, taught at Tulsa Tech, advanced recording techniques, got into video, started a production company, and then about a year ago, we kind of merged uh, four or five different companies into one company, which is Grassfire. And so now we have, you know, audio, video, 3D, web, live, you know, just kind of everything coming together and it's been really cool. And so of course we're building the studio on Studio Row, right next to Teresa's She Set She Shed. Is that what we're gonna <laughs> No, she we're shed. not gonna call it. Teresa's she shed. That's... She buried the lead. We're having a she shed. We call it a she shed. That's wow. so funny. I love that. So and, and just so we're clear, there's there's quite a bit more of us than's represented right here in this three. So we have Ryan Rex, um, who's amazing marketing PR. Uh, writer, we have Tony Shanks, who is just a web genius. Has done a lot of really great things with uh, with with graphic design and stuff like that. And then we've got Brandon Hicks over here, and I'll let you. Yeah, so I'm Brandon Hicks. I uh, have a background in 3D graphics, animation, uh, and I'm teaching this semester at University of Florida. He's Pittsburgh. a professor so, now. Wow. Oh. I'm an adjunct <laughs> professor. Adjunct. <laughs> and Brandon, you have to share. I mean, you don't have to share a lot, but we. Part of our entertainment network is a, a project we're working on, an animated uh, series starring... Uh, yeah. Yes, Gary Busey. So <laughs> we are very excited working on uh, this new animated series with Gary and Teresa and the whole team. What's the name of it? Uh, Busey's Nuts. Which <laughs> Imagine. Is, uh, it's, a Imagine. Fitting, it's a fitting name. Yeah. It is a very uh, crazy show, but it, it matches no. Gary's personality. <laughs> so uh, we're, yeah, sure. we're really happy to be working on that. And um, it's uh, it's been... A, crazy ride so far so I, I am looking forward to where that goes yeah so we're going to deploy that soon again just this diverse offering that we're going to do in entertainment and Cade actually wrote the theme song um of course Gary kind of um did his re-wrote own interpretation he did not rewrite it Cade wrote a great song it doesn't exist anymore but it actually it's <laughs> still there <laughs> the title of the song was Busey's Back because it's uh this you know, actor that's been down on his luck that's coming back as an influencer. You've been and, such a help uh, to him. So, well, he's, <laughs> yes. I have such a soft spot for him. I know, and you know, people love him. Sorry, changed your song. Yeah. <laughs> So, oh, but uh, but we had some great artists uh, that came in, and we recorded that at Tea Garden Studio. Yeah, so, yeah. David and uh, Gary go way back, and so way back. yeah, <laughs> he, way back. <laughs> and uh, he helped uh, rein him in. But Gary's a true prof- professional. So when you get a camera and a recording with him, he yep. goes into this yes. mode, and he might not be so professional all the time, but he really expects it. He, Which he is does. good. He requires a lot. Yes, he does. Right. Yeah. So he asked me to transcribe his handwritten song notes, <laughs> and I'm sitting here sweating bullets because it's it's like beyond doctor handwriting, and I'm sitting yeah. here and I'm like, what's this say? <laughs> is that a word? You know? <laughs> and so I type it up. He's like, and then uh, he would stand over what? you during that. What? what was that? You know? <laughs> <laughs> you tell me. Sorry. <laughs> So it's been a lot of fun. We just want to have a lot of fun with this. And, mm-hmm. and again, it's it's primarily recording studio, but you can see we're offering a lot of different things. And everyone in this room is passionate about good music. And, mm-hmm. you know, you mentioned COVID. It's such... It's such a dark spot in what's going on mm-hmm. in uh, in the world right now. It's not just America, but you think about after JFK was shot, I mean, think about how the country was. Well, what kind of brought us out of that? Well, it was when the Beatles came to America. Yeah. So I think we have an incredible opportunity. And we're doing some exterior art too, uh, across from the church, that sort of thing, but everything is happy. We're not doing political messages. We're not you know, preaching this or that, but it's like, 
let's go back to basics. It's yeah. flowers, it's aromatherapy, it's <laughs> yeah. good music, it's celebrating friends, it's celebrating um, what makes us human, and it connects us. And music really is a universal language. So that sounds big and kind of pie in the sky, but that's what we want the church to be. And we want the entire strategy, the entire philosophy to be a bright spot, even though a lot of people are broken right now in a lot of different ways. So. The Harwelden Mansion, located in Tulsa, Oklahoma, is your choice for a luxury destination bed and breakfast. Stunning and unique, beautifully decorated suites await you for your business or leisure. Constructed in the 1920s, the historic Harwelden Mansion boasts elegant and comfortable accommodations. Egyptian cotton towels, Peacock Alley linens, and Hermes bath products. All rooms stocked with complimentary beer, wine, tea, coffee, and soda. And you'll appreciate the welcome snack and turn down service, minutes from the world renowned gathering place. Book your overnight stay at harweldenmansion.com. That's H A R W E L D E N mansion.com. Yeah, and what was it you said when we initially started the podcast? It was about this is going to be sound and what was our our thing? Do you remember? No one knows what I'm talking about. <laughs> okay, what are we doing? the about space the and time. Yeah. You know the whole oh, space yeah. and time. Leon's thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Leon was known as master of space and time. Exactly. And so, uh, yeah, absolutely. This is um, this will transcend space and time and. Um, and we're coming to you from like Earl's Chamber at right. the Harwelden right now, but eventually we're going to be broadcasting from from the, the church. church studio, right? right? Absolutely, and uh, maybe sometimes uh, in the chamber uh, again. Our two subterrain echo chambers that we're developing, um, the basement. We have some extra rooms. I mean, the entire church. We have some collaborative spaces. Um, uh, every square foot is 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 incredible, and so we'll have an opportunity. I'm sure the guys would like a permanent place, right? <laughs> Moving equipment around is not always the easiest thing to do. So. You would think I would be better in better shape from all the equipment that I have to move around. I, I don't know. Yeah. Maybe we should keep moving. Yeah. So but, what what date are you looking at the church studio being open, Teresa? Yeah, we're going to update us on that. Sure, we're going to be pretty much finished uh, by the end of the year. It's going to take a month to six weeks to set up the equipment. Um, I referenced our console, which is really the holy grail of the oh, recording yeah. studio. It's in San yeah. Francisco right now. Um, we bought, uh, purchased flying, flying faders. It's a 32 channel. Um, but we also have our tech room in San Francisco because with analog, you have components to the equipment. And so we're going to have a pretty, pretty cool workspace uh, next to the control room at the church. But again, we have that set up in San Francisco because the people that can work on it and the equipment is there. So we'll be moving that here. And we'll probably have a soft opening. We have some uh, artists we've identified that will um, be in there. And uh, we have some events. Um, one event we're really excited about is for a group of people called Leon Lifers, mm -hmm. and they it's are a real group. And it's a real group. It's a real group, and they are serious they're free all over the country. Yes. Yeah, and don't mess with them. Oh, well, they're, they're everywhere. Leon. Yeah, yeah. Fact. Russia, they're from Spain, Russia. Spain, we, yeah, they're everywhere. we also have merchandise. Uh, we have an online store, and you can get that right now. Yeah, you go to churchstudio.com backslash shop, and and you can uh, tap in and purchase our merchandise. Um, and that goes to our foundation. We've also formed a 501c3 called the Church Studio Music Foundation. And we're doing that one, we'll have opportunities to scholarship artists uh, to record in the church. Um, but we are also supporting musicians during the pandemic. And um, we also sponsor uh, different music related events. So, um, you know, we are a business, but we want to make sure that uh, we're giving back to the, not only the community, but the artists um, across the country. Yeah. Yep. Well, we thank you so much for, in so many ways, Teresa Knox, for being, you know, from Tulsa and for mm -hmm. just, you know, making all these projects come to life, especially the church studio, which is the real star of this podcast. Yeah, absolutely. None of us are. <laughs> 
You guys are no stars. No. <laughs> Everyone the in this room. Yeah. So big things um, ahead. The podcast it's going to be open soon. Mm-hmm. So we'll have a time and we'll have a, a, a more information about the podcast. And as John Moss would tell me, when we do get it up and going, subscribe and like. Absolutely. We're on all social platforms, YouTube, a lot of content. It's kind of unusual to have a podcast that's on video. Uh, thanking these guys uh, yeah. for that. But um yeah, follow us and um, you'll love it. And we mentioned Gary a couple of times today, Gary Busey. He is our next guest on the podcast, so he will be coming to Earl's <laughs> Chamber. Is Try the liquor up, stopped? That should be interesting. John, <laughs> how's stopped. the liquor? Okay. Well, that's for everybody, not Gary. <laughs> so we appreciate you all joining us today. And when we let you know all the details about From the Chamber, make sure that you like and subscribe. And we appreciate you watching today and listening. I'm Lisa Jones. And I'm Kate Roberts.